Now we would like to move on to tonight's panel discussion, Strengthening the U.S.-Japan Alliance. What we learned from the 311 response and reconstruction. Please refer to the program for detailed bios of tonight's distinguished panelists. I would now like to ask Ms. Suzanne Basala, tonight's moderator, to come to the stage and I'll hand the mic over to her. Ms. Basala? Well, thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to see everybody. And um, it's kind of a tough act to follow both that video and Ms. Murakami's wonderful remarks. And I am, where is, where is Murakami? There you are. I'm deeply, deeply touched by your story and grateful to you for being so brave and sharing your story with us and being such a great role model for all of us. So thank you so much. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm Suzanne Basala, as introduced. And set my timer here to make sure um, we're fine. I want to say, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here to moderate this panel. Panel, Thank you, Ambassador, for including me into your team. Now, tonight's panel um, has already been introduced. And it really, uh, we're going to try to incorporate three key themes. Um, first, as you know, we're reflecting back 10 years later. So we really want to reflect on the earthquake itself and the, the triple disaster and on the response. And we're going to think about the immediate recovery, rescue, and relief, um, but also the longer-term recovery and the ways the United States and Japan work together. And we're lucky to have some um, key first-hand ex uh, folks, folks who have experienced it firsthand. Second, we're going to talk about what did we learn then from that experience after thinking and reflecting. And um, you know, before March 11th, it, 2011, it was impossible for us to imagine a disaster like the Great East Japan earthquake and the cascading disaster that we had. And similarly, I, none of us, I, I think, could imagine the situation we're in right now with the pandemic. And when we look ahead at climate change, well, frankly, we've been warned about it, but it's hard for us all to understand and think about what's happening with cl the climate crisis. And so I think that it's important that we take these lessons and we um, think about those in the context of other um, disasters uh, that are we need to address together. And finally, this conversation is about the U.S.-Japan relationship, given where we are, and thinking about how did this experience strengthen the U.S.-Japan relationship and continue to strengthen the U.S.-Japan relationship. So I'm pleased to be joined tonight by three very well-known leaders of the relationship, and you have their detailed biographies, um, so I'm only going to briefly introduce them. And um, I guess, you know, well, I'll start with on, on, on the screen, I hope. Um, we should have Mr. Richard Halberstadt, who's the superintendent of the Ishinomaki Reconstruction Memorial. Oh, great, there you are. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us from Ishinomaki. Thank you, Richard. Um, and then moving across the Pacific, we're honored to also welcome Ambassador John Roos, who served as our ambassador, of course, during the crisis. He was the ambassador from 2009 to 2013. John is joining us from Silicon Valley. And good afternoon, Ambassador Roos. Good afternoon, Suzanne. Great. And then joining us in the room, and Admiral, if you could join me up here. Joining us in the room, hailing from Texas, we are grateful to welcome Admiral Patrick Walsh, who led Operation Tomodachi, the US military response to the 311 disaster. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you, John, on VTC again, just like the old days. <laughs> that's, that's true. Um, great to see you as well, Pat. Great. So let's get started. And I'm going to start with you, uh, Ambassador Roos, if I could. Um, I know from experience that you faced many challenges in supporting Tohoku's recovery. Um, those challenges and your response to those challenges evolved over time. Can you share a bit with the audience here about some of those challenges and how you eventually found yourself committing to supporting young people? Well, first of all, let me thank uh, Ambassador Tomito for those powerful words. Um, and also, the, as you noted, Suzanne, the in incredible video uh, 
that brings back uh, both difficult but very positive memories. But most of all, uh, Hinako, who I spent some time with before this session, is an incredible young woman who is, I think we can all agree, uh, the epitome of what we all want out of the people-to-people -people connections in the U.S.-Japan relations. So thank and thank you for including me. Um, you know, I'm incredibly proud of the role that uh, our embassy played in um, in the aftermath of March 11th. Uh, obviously, it was a minor role compared to the incredible leadership of Admiral Walsh and the Operation Tomodachi, as well as uh, the resilience and strength of uh, the Japanese people that you know came together to address this incredible crisis. We had um, numerous challenges, obviously, during the crisis itself, challenges of communication, misinformation, how we could best find a way to help uh, the people of Tohoku and the people of Japan in uh, their most difficult moment after World War II, since World War II. Um, and, you know, as I said, I'm proud that we were able to play a role, but most important was in the aftermath of uh, Operation Tomodachi. We really wanted to figure out how we could continue to help the people of Tohoku, um, you know, in a substantive and important way. Uh, what we did in the aftermath, as you know, Suzanne, because it was in large part your leadership, as well as I believe Jim Zumwalt may be in the audience tonight, and Jim's leadership as well as the Deputy Chief of Mission, where we went and spoke to all the different stakeholders um, who had been impacted by the Great East Japan earthquake and nuclear crisis. And we asked a simple question, what can we do in the United States to continue to help um, in the aftermath of uh, that great disaster? And we mostly listened. And in the end, interestingly, uh, a person who had a great impact on our thinking was Mayor Toba of Rikas and Takata, who said to us, you know, what you can do uh, the people of the United States and the embassy uh, in Tokyo, you can find a way to provide hope to the young people of uh, the Tohoku region. And one thing led to another. And as you know, we came up with the idea to build on Operation Tomodachi and started the Tomodachi Initiative, which was to invest in the young people of Japan and connect them to the United States. And we did everything from a Major League Baseball initiative of building a stadium in Ishinomaki to student exchanges that Hinako participated in. And um, that is just a small thing that I think we did that I, think, that I believe we're all proud of um, to confront the aftermath and the reconstruction effort that obviously was the primary responsibility of the Japanese government. And so uh, we looked for a way of how we could play a role in providing hope to the younger generation. And I'm proud to have played a part in it. I'm proud that all of you or many of you in the audience today uh, participated in that effort as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Roos. And I'm um, sorry you're not here in the room to see so many friends. And, and it is filled with people who had a lot to contribute. And I'm glad to be able to spend this evening with all of you. So speaking of key players, let's bring Admiral Walsh into the conversation. Admiral Operation Tomodachi really became a symbol of US-Japan friendship and made the benefits of the alliance quite visible in new ways to different audiences. Can you tell us about how Operation Tomodachi's impact on the Security Alliance, Alliance and more broadly, um, how it impacted the US-Japan relationship. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, I would enjoy that opportunity, but I would be remiss if I took another breath here without recognizing the leadership of Ambassador Roos. For those of you who spent time in his office, 
um, Jim, Suzanne, and many others. You may remember the picture that he had prominently displayed in his office of John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy with one head looking down, the other head kind of looking over the shoulder of uh, a brother and just sensing the great weight of decisions that were on their shoulders as they tried to contemplate the gravity of the future that they were seeing and at the same time trying to bring with it wisdom, understanding, and a sense of humanity and community and conveying all that in one sense of message of leadership. And Ambassador Roos, uh, you did that for us. You did that for the State Department team. You did it for the Department of Defense team. And uh, I'll tell you, I look back on that period of time, as tragic as it was, as being part of something that was truly wonderful. And uh, we credit you for your leadership during that intense period of time where the weight of the world was on your shoulders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You point out relationships, uh, the relationship of the United States to Japan, both during and then afterwards. And, and I would like to highlight the relationship of the United States with the rest of the region as well, because I, I think both were affected <clears throat> in terms of the United States and the region. And I've had recent uh, track two dialogue with Chinese colleagues and counterparts uh, where we talked about where national interests are. If you talk to Chinese colleagues, they'll talk about their national interest in terms of sovereignty and geography. But if you talk to the United States in terms of what our national interest is in, it's our partnership, it's our friends. And specifically, citing the example of the US response to the Great Eastern Japan earthquake, tsunami, and radiation disaster as an example of the risk that we take for our partners, our colleagues, our friends. So the relationship, I think, really starts um, in terms of the response. Um, if you look at the speed of the response, our, um, our self-defense force colleagues will say they were uh, very, very happy with how quickly we responded. And, and there's actually many in the room here that were part of that first response. For my US colleagues, if you could raise your hand if you were part of that effort. I would suggest before you leave tonight, please have an opportunity to just shake hands and hear their story of what it was like in the moments after 2.46 p.m. Japan time on March 11, 2011. They each have their own story. I'm fond of telling the, the story of Scott Van Busker, who was responsible for our 7th Fleet at the time who without any sort of request for permission went ahead and started moving ships to the territorial limit as fast as humanly possible in order to be in position to respond to a request as quickly as possible when it came in from the government of Japan. So the speed of the response, the scale of the response and the, and the complexity associated with it because it was humanitarian assistance, it was disaster relief and it was a radiation disaster with all sorts of consequence management uh, implications. I find it interesting today that we commemorate this on the day that, for the first time in a long time, Facebook is off the air. <laughs> and, I, and I draw the connection because many of you may or may not remember, but we needed Facebook. Because at the time, we were still wedded to kind of a legacy way of communicating. And we hadn't really understood uh, what the profound constructive consequences were of social media. Facebook became the go-to source for so many people that had so many questions because information was so, so critically important to everyone around them. And in many respects, Facebook answered the immediacy of the questions of so many people who were wondering whether they were in danger or not. So the message that goes to the region is, is the criticality of our relationship with Japan and the amount of risk that we will take on behalf of our friends. In terms of the relationship between Japan and the United States, we look at that, at that team that we built 
as an opportunity to work in ways that we hadn't really explored before with the Joint Support Force. And the reason that we ended up with the Joint Support Force and this idea of being unified in effort rather than in command is because we recognized we had a very, very serious problem. And we needed the best. We needed the best solutions that the world could offer. So we had to think very differently than traditional sorts of hierarchical command arrangements. I, I look back with, with some delight as I, as I remember the faces of those um, Air Force officers who were waiting to see this Navy guy show up with four stars. And, and they were like, you know, we got, we got to manage now some guy here that, uh, in addition to this really, really severe problem. And what we found is that if we thought differently, because we had a problem that was beyond our capability to solve, if we thought horizontally rather than vertically, if we thought about unity of effort rather than unity of command, then we could have transparency and our Japanese colleagues could see the bad news and the good news together. And there was no US only, no Japan only meeting. It was just us because there was no one else to solve this problem. That's the irony, is that we worked through something that was really, really hard. And, and yet, the question that you're really asking is can you pivot forward and just manage the routine? There's something about a crisis that gives you the opportunity to say, you know what, the old solution just wasn't gonna work. The old culture wasn't gonna work in terms of how the institutional would bias would kind of move at a snail's pace to come up with solutions. And what we found is what was really within the world of the possible. That was Operation Tomodachi. Thank you very much. Um, so much to follow up on that. But what I do want to bring in Richard into the conversation, and Richard, thank you again for joining us from Ishinomaki. Um, Thank you. And Richard, we've, we've heard a little bit from Ms. Murakami and others tonight about recovery of the region, but you've been living there um, for, for decades. Um, so can you amplify what we've heard and also share what you see has been the biggest change in Ishinomaki um, because of the disaster and the recovery efforts? Okay, um, well, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me and giving me a chance to, to talk about Ishinomaki. Um, which, uh, as everyone knows, is uh, Hinako Murakami's hometown, and I'm speaking to you from there now, very early in the morning, so forgive me if I start yawning. Um, and um, my experience of the disaster and, and, and what happened afterwards has led into this job that I'm doing now. I'm speaking to you from the center where I work and where we talk about uh, the disaster and reconstruction projects. Um, and uh, a lot of what I talk about usually ends up uh, being statistics and talking about things like the height of the tsunami and infrastructure aspects like roads being built and new buildings being built after um, everything was destroyed by the tsunami. Um, but I thought today I would like to maybe change the focus a bit uh, and, and look at a more human aspect of, of what happened after the disaster. Um, because uh, one, one thing um, I thought provided an interesting parallel uh, to what uh, has been going on during the pandemic over in the USA as well, um, where, as I understand, um, the, the, the meatpacking uh, industry uh, has involved a lot of frontline workers um, going through very, very hard times because of the pandemic and uh, many people leaving the job and there being difficulties in hiring new people in this industry. And this uh, is an interesting comparison with uh, here in Ishinomaki just after the disaster, um, where of course our main industry is fisheries and fishing. And so uh, many, many uh, workers in marine processing factories and so on, uh, they left just after the disaster because the factories were, of course, completely non-functional and uh, had, many had been destroyed completely. Um, and we also had trouble uh, rehiring people just after the disaster, um, although there was a noticeable difference in the way that um, the companies that looked after their workers 
uh, better before the disaster, had an easier time rehiring people afterwards, which um, just goes to show the human aspect and how important it is. So that is one thing that just struck me as regards the pandemic. Um, but also uh, on a more optimistic note, I should say, um, the tsunami, despite the destruction and the chaos it caused and, and, and the heartache and the sorrow, um, it also brought out the best in people in so many ways. Of course, that was, that was in Operation Tomodachi as well and, and, and all the fantastic and wonderful help we received from the US. Um, but in many, many areas in Ishinomaki, we are seeing um, a lot more cooperation and collaboration, um, basically out of necessity. One very big example of this is the fishing associations, which are dotted all around the coast of Ishinomaki. We have a very, very long coast here. Um, and pre-tsunami, uh, they tended to be very jealous of their own territory and, and, and work independently of each other. Uh, whereas after the disaster, um, it basically forced them to collaborate more, to work together and to cooperate. Um, uh, this was partly just out of necessity because, you know, so many things had been completely destroyed that they had to work together, borrowing and lending equipment uh, between each other and so on. Um, and so you have this new atmosphere of uh, cooperation uh, born out from the disaster and not only the fishing associations but also in other areas like the marine processing industry and companies that used to work separately uh, coming together uh, and maybe jointly developing new uh, foods uh, of which Hinako is, is, is so uh, complementary um, and, and lots more uh, cooperation coming out of that very very sad thing is, is something that strikes me at the moment. Sorry for my long speech. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a really good reminder of the importance of taking care of each other through the hard times and to be better prepared for when things get back to easier times. And so as you mentioned, those who took care of their workers during the crisis had a better opportunity to hire workers afterwards. And that's a, a very important point. And it, it kind of ties into something that you were talking about, Admiral Walsh, about um, the kind of the institutionalization of the cooperation, perhaps, and you, you know, you said it's easier in a crisis to find new ways to innovate and to do things. I'm interested in your thoughts about how that has um, stayed. I mean, you know, we're now we're looking forward into, you know, how we can cooperate in a future crisis. And how much do you think some of those um, practices have been institutionalized? Have we institutionalized the resilience? Do we um, have the ability to work together? on some of the upcoming, if we faced an upcoming disaster, um, or do we have to kind of relearn some of those in a crisis? How do you see that? Yeah, so the question is, how do you embed the key sort of lessons that, uh, that pass on from one, one group to the next, one generation to the next, without um, the easy sort of way of saying, well, that was just a one-off kind of thing. That was a thousand year event, you know, a 9.1 magnitude earthquake changed the tilt of the Earth's axis, moved Japan seven feet. What are the chances of having that come up again? The point is, is really um, contingencies and the planning associated with that, at least among the uniform forces, uh, to become more familiar with each other and what their red lines are as a team, what will work and what won't work. I thought that was critically important to the architecture that went into building Operation Tomodachi. It's also important to know how to give credit. So here's an example uh, from a different contingency. It was 9-11. When Japan came to the, to the assistance of the United States with Operation Enduring Freedom, the operation which is recently uh, shut down with the, uh, the evacuation of Afghanistan. Uh, what Japan did, what the Diet approved back in 2003-04 timeframe was oil. They provided oil for maritime shipping that could be part of a coalition. And what that oil did was it allowed countries such as Pakistan to participate. And because Pakistan could participate, they could lead. And when they led, then Saudi Arabia joined and the rest of the GCC participated. So those seeds were planted because of the Japanese government. And yet, stories like that rarely get passed along 
as future generations of, of leaders in government sort of look back on and ask the hard questions of whether or not it makes sense for them to participate in future sorts of um, uh, operations like this. Uh, what we'll say from the United States perspective is that we became very, very close to our colleagues in Japan because we took risk on their behalf and, and they became very close with us. At this point, we have a working relationship that has now become institutionalized among leaders. And so it becomes second nature to go talk to our brothers and sisters in Japan when we prepare ourselves for deployment and we rehearse contingencies and plan. Well, that's encouraging. So thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Roos, I'm going to bring you back into the conversation here. Um, you've spoken about the can-do spirit of Silicon Valley, and you talked about it many times, how that applies to the Alliance and how together we can do so much for the world. Um, so what is your message as you think about what happened 10 years ago and how Japan has, U.S.-Japan relationship has evolved since the 311 crisis up to how it is today? Um, what is your message for those who are taking responsibility for ensuring a strong U.S.-Japan relationship, especially some of the younger leaders? Well, I, I know we're short on time, Suzanne, so I, I will try to be brief. Let me just build a little bit upon, on what Admiral Walsh was just talking about. You know, ultimately, Japan coming to our assistance and, and you know, when, when we were at a time of need, us coming to Japan's assistance in their time of need, um, it really gets back to uh, the connections between our two peoples and the people-to-people -people relations. And you and I have talked many times about the importance of investing in the younger generation. And, you know, I am here in Silicon Valley and the message that I've always had for the young entrepreneurs here is um, think big, take risks, don't worry, don't be too concerned about failure. It's a learning experience. And I hope that our younger generations um, continue to think uh, and learn that lesson and continue to think in that regard. And I think if you look at Taylor Anderson and Monty Dixon and Hinako today, um, these are young people, the Americans that were part of our JET program that went and really took a risk and uh, expanded their horizons by going to Japan and really deepening the bond between our two countries. Uh, just as Hinako took a risk in coming here to the United States and learning English, which she told me earlier, she didn't know any English 10 years ago and lived here. And those connections ultimately uh, bind our two countries together. You know, as you remember, I used to say um, when I was the ambassador that I didn't worry about the security relationship that was under the in the good hands of Admiral Walsh and others. I didn't worry about the economic relationship, but I always worried about the people to people connections, because ultimately that's what it's all about in every aspect that we're talking about today. So my message to young people is take the risk, study abroad, learn English, learn Japanese, and ultimately that if we invest heavily and our younger generation invests heavily in the relationship, we ultimately have nothing to worry about. Thank you. That's another way, you know, Admiral Walsh, you talked about embedding the lessons and, and having them available for the future. And I think those people-to-people -people connections and investing in young people and also embed these, these cooperation for the future. So I think we're actually, um, I'm looking for someone for a signal. I think we're running out of time. So I think I'm going to go ahead and bring the, um, the discussion to a, a close, unfortunately. Um, but to me, the really inspirational points that I took away from the conversation is that crises demand that we cooperate in innovative ways. And I, you talked about horizontal cooperation and, and thinking differently in a crisis. And we saw that in, in the militaries, within the fishery industry. We heard about that from Richard. 
and in, in the innovative ways we supported young people through Tomodachi Initiative and other activities that other people did to support young people. And such cooperation not only got us through the crisis, but they also transformed the alliance and made it stronger and more resilient. And we heard about that in different ways today. And so it may be an awkward thing to say, but I think we are a better alliance because of the tragic events 10 years ago and because of our response to the events 10 years ago. So it is up to all of us who are committed to the alliance, many of us in the room today, to apply those lessons and to the current pandemic crisis and also to the worsening climate crisis as well. So I think um, hopefully you all had a chance to get some inspiration as well and will join me in thanking our speakers, um, Admiral Walsh for joining me here. So I'm not lonely on the stage and then John and Richard from uh, Silicon Valley and from Ishinomaki, thank you. Suzanne, can I say one more thing? Go ahead, John. Technology is incredible in bringing us all together, but there is nothing like being in the same room with all of you and sharing the Japanese meal that you're about to have <laughs> that I very much miss being with you. And, so, uh, and John, they're pouring Kenzo wine tonight. Oh, oh really? Yeah. <laughs> for, those, for those of you who don't know, my daughter was married at the Kenzo Winery in Napa, and we enjoyed Kenzo wine. <laughs> so I miss it even more. We'll toast you both. Thank you so right, much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to everyone on the panel and to Ms. Basala for a very inspirational and meaningful discussion.